Hello and welcome to HST tutorial 14 on overcoming PAM4 design and measurement challenges with Keysight ADS and Flex DCA link. So before we go into live demo, let's understand some of the specific characterization figures of merit for 400G or PAM4 standard. If you look at various standards where PAM4 is used, um, you know, some of them are 400G class. Um, IEEE 802.3BS, which is for 200-400G um, base Ethernet, OIF CEI 56G, 802.3CD, uh, 64G fiber channel, 800G class, and so on. All these standards typically use uh, PAM4, and some of them are now even thinking to use PAM8. Let's look at some of the key characteristics or measurements which you need to perform an optical or electrical transmitter. Um, in NRZ transmitters, we typically used to do measurements like optical modulation, amplitude, extension ratio, transmitter dispersion penalty, which we call as TDP, and I mask. Uh, starting with PAM4, the measurements are slightly different, and we do outer optical modulation amplitude, that is difference between three level and zero level, outer extension ratio, and one of the most important measurement, TDEC-Q. Um, the typical eye mask mode is no longer used in PAM4, which used to be the case in NRC cases. So TDEQ is one of the key measurement. It tells us the performance of the transmitter relative to an ideal transmitter. For NRZ, TDP will literally measure the BER performance of the transmitter and compare it to actual golden transmitter. And there we need to calculate how much extra power was required at receiver to compensate for non-ideal performance. It was expensive and time consuming to measure. However, for TDQ, we indirectly measure SER. It's very cost effective and relatively fast to measure. In TDQ, uh, we leverage the very high target SCR, SER. And we first statistically determine the SER directly on the signal which we have on the scope software. Rather than to attenuate the signal to force error, we mathematically add noise to create errors. And we keep increasing the noise amplitude unless the target SER is observed. We then repeat the same process for a virtual ideal transmitter. Now, once we have both of the noise quantities, we simply take the ratio of the noise added to an ideal transmitter to our device under test. And this dB difference in the noise level give us TDEQ. Now, this is one of the very key, um, you know, parameters to be measured in PAM4. Now, think about uh, to find the root cause of high TDEQ. Well, you need to think about receiver and take a look at things like linearity, skew, and noise margin. Advanced TDEQ analysis in PAM4 application helps to isolate which signal components are dominating the overall TDEQ result. So, for this, we can take a look at measurements such as partial TDEQ, partial SER and partial noise margin. This will help us to isolate the root cause. Now, in terms of measurements, although not valid for simulation, there are keys to accurate and repeatable TDEQ tests. First, we need a required well-designed optimized, op optimized equalizer, FFE, uh, for um, res you know, doing the reference receiver, we apply the correct frequency response in the oscilloscope channel. And in Keysight Oscilloscope, we have a unique capability of doing impulse response correction. Low noise, because when small signals are measured, oscilloscope channel noise can corrupt the construction of measurement. Low noise will enable better TDEQ measurement. So in the scope software, such as Flex DCA, we have a large suite of measurements to support TDEQ. It's very fast and easy to implement. The good news, of, good news for ADS designers, they can buy Flex DCA software without buying the scope hardware and then use the software along with ADS. And this link solution is future ready. So tomorrow if you are doing PAM8, you know, kind of measurements, the same link will even give you measurements for PAM8 kind of signals. So let's take a look at the sample bench, which we are currently simulating in traditional way, uh, connecting iProbe to various places. And this is a 56G PAM4 link design with IBS AMI models on both ends. When we simulate this design traditionally in ADS data display, we can plot eye diagrams at various places where we have connected the eye probes. So in this case, we have three eye probes. So let's plot data one by one. So we plot the eye at the transmitter output. We can then go and filter out the eye plot 
as a channel output. And finally, we can plot the I, I diagram as the receiver output. Now here, using this traditional plots, we can inspect the eye quality. Now some of the key measurements like eye height, eye width, etc. can also be done by you know, plotting the results in a table. So once we insert a table, each eye plot has a summary. Now once we you know, add the summary after the receiver, we get all the key measurements which are being performed by our eye probe. Similarly, we can also plot summary at the channel output. So that in a single table, we can compare um, the levels of eye height, eye width, etc. As you can see right now, in my table, I have two uh, measurement um, you know, summary plots, uh, giving you the level set after the receiver and also after the channel. But PAM4, as, as I described earlier, requires much more measurements like ice cues, TDEC Q, etc. Doing that by post-processing can be quite challenging and that's why Keysight decided to add a flex DCA link inside ADS. Using this link, um, you know, designers can configure how many channels they want to measure at the same time. Currently, maximum eight channels are supported, uh, which is quite a lot actually in a typical serial link design. These channels can be assigned as differential or single-ended and we can assign the memory number as well as the slot number. We can also save temporary intermediate waveform files, which are pretty useful in case Flex DCA is not installed on our PC where ADS is. And we want to load these waveforms to oscilloscope or some other PC. Using the dynamic mode, all these things will be dynamically controlled by ADS and we will be able to run Flex DCA along with ADS design. The symbol of Flex DCA will you know, get reshaped depending upon how many channels has been defined. So here with the same channel, I have another schematic where I have placed a Flex DCA probe. And this Flex DCA probe is um, you know, defined to have two differential channels at the input and one single ended output. And the first differential channel is the transmitter output. Um, then second is the channel output. And third is a single ended, which is after receiver, where we have CTLE implemented in the AMI model. I have also assigned slot number seven and five to channel output and receiver output, which will allow us to do jitter measurement. Once we start simulation, ADA detects the Flex DCA probe, and if it is in dynamic mode and Flex DCA is installed, it will invoke the Flex DCA software and push all the waveform data into Flex DCA software. Now, once we have data in Flex DCA, we could go ahead and arrange the plots in the fashion I want. There are multiple options in Flex DCA software. So here with multi-plot option, I can see memory one output, which is the transmitter output, memory two, which is the channel output, and then memory three, which is the receiver output. And also we can, do, we can see two slot data using which we could be able to perform the jitter measurements. Now again, let's go to single plot mode to see waveforms and eye diagrams clearly. And going to signals options, we can switch off the channels which we don't want to see um, at the right now. So we will go ahead and switch on all the plots except M1, which is the transmitter output. Uh, if you want to perform certain measurements on transmitter output, we can go ahead and do that. Using the left mouse button, we can also drag and recenter the eye diagram. We can then look at the channel output and as expected is slightly offset uh, from the transmitter due to channel delay. And then we can similarly switch on M3 output. Now once we have the receiver output which is M3, we can go ahead and take a look at the left hand side and we can find various measurements. So let's try to do that, some of these measurements on our channel output by switching on you know, 7A or we could switch on M2. Now, going to the various modes of this software, currently we are in eye mask mode, but we can switch on to TDR mode, oscilloscope mode, or jitter analysis mode. So let's continue on eye mode for now. By going to PAM tab, we can see all the PAM4 related measurements which we have here. And all these measurements are single click. We can keep scrolling through the available one button measurements and whichever we want to perform. Uh, we can go ahead and click. For example, if I click on eye levels, it will go and do three eye level measurements. If we click on the measurements tab, the results tab, we can also see the indication of where it is 
in the iProbe. So it's very intuitive. It makes job of designer very easy. And we can go ahead and delete the measurements if required. Now, similarly, we can look at eye height, eye width, which are the traditional measurements um, as may be required very commonly. And again, you can see if we click on the measurements, uh, we can see where exactly the eye height, etc. measurement is happening on which channel it is happening. It's not necessary to do one channel by one channel. We could do measurements for various channels at the same time. And we can also compare the performance of multiple channels. Currently, I have activated only one channel, hence I'm only able to do, you know, measurements on, on one channel only. Right, so once we do that, we can also switch on uh, M3 where our eye is already equalized and we have a CR better than E raised to minus four or minus five. Uh, we can then perform TDEQ measurement. For TDEQ measurement, our, our eye has to be, or a CR has to be better than one E raised to minus four. So all the theory I described earlier has been, uh, is being performed internally and we can see directly the TDEQ measurement which is close to three dB right now for our equalized eye. Uh, going to um, you know regular measurements, we can also, as illustrated earlier, along with the TDEQ, we can also take a look at some of these traditional measurements. Now, if we want to find out uh, which um, you know parameter is causing the distortion or the maximum damage in TDEQ, we could go ahead and invoke linearity and we can choose a specific standard, which is the beauty of this measurement software. Uh, because it gives every information on designer's fingertip to very quickly calculate some of these interesting measurements. So by looking at level skews or uh, we can also perform eye skews, we can get a sense of uh, which eye, whether it is eye 0, 1 or 2, uh, is contributing to the maximum uh, percentage in the TDEQ. And according to that information, designers can take a call how to correct this problem in case you are over and above the compliance limit mask. Now by switching off um, you know, the M3 channel, uh, there are various math functions also which designers can apply. For example, by clicking on math, we can go and perform various math uh, functions or go to signal processing and perform some common signal processing. Certain standards may recommend to apply, um, let's say fourth or the Bessel filter in a CTLE to perform TDEQ measurements like it is done in A22.3BS. So by placing these two blocks, we can make connections and then we can provide an input. So in our case, our channel output is 7A on which we would like to perform a 33 gigahertz Bessel filter. By double clicking on the Bessel filter block, we can apply the cutoff frequency. And by double clicking on CTLE, we can then provide our own poles and zeros certification, or we can use the preset as specified in the standard. See how easy it is to, to go through various things using the software inside your design platform. So in this case, we will go ahead and use a to 2.3BS, uh, 3DB CTLE number, and all the zeros and poles are populated itself. The output for us will be available at channel F2. So now we can minimize the math block and going to signal list, we can activate channel F2 and we can look at the equalized eye after applying our Bessel filtering and the CTLE as recommended in the standard. Now we can repeat the same measurement on this eye plot like TDEQ, partial TDEQ, uh, partial noise, etc. But for now, let's go to jitter because jitter is another very important measurement and quite complex to to do post-processing on. So with the same channel F2, we can also see the jitter measurements or we can switch on and switch out, um, you know, channel 7A, uh, which is the channel output uh, as per our design. And by clicking not to scale, it starts performing the measurements on the channel output data from ADS. Here we can see the total jitter. Uh, we can see various IE performances. Uh, we can see jitter, jitter segregation, etc. If needed, we can click on limits point and then we can enter our own limits or our own criteria uh, for measurements, uh, for some of these measurements. Now, overall jitter is close to 32.8 picosecond and then we can also look at various jitter numbers. 
Uh, we can perform the same jitter in the slot 5A, which is the receiver output, and see after equalization how much of the data or how much of these jitter numbers have been improved. Um, now looking at here, uh, from 32 picosecond, the jitter, the total jitter has come down to around 28.4, um, uh, you know, kind of picoseconds. And we can also look at rest of the jitter plots. Well, we stop here. Hope this video was of some help to you. Subscribe to my YouTube channel for more such interesting videos. Uh, wish you best of luck and happy designing. Feel free to contact me in case you need any further support on performing some of these complex measurements on PAM4. Thank you very much for watching the video.